Hello, I'm Nicholas Dorman, Sam's Jane Lang Davis Chief Conservator. We're here in the museum's Newcomb Conservation Studio to look at Monet's fishing boats at Etretat. This is such an important painting for the museum's collection. Having an exhibition like this gives us a really excellent opportunity to study it closely and do a little bit of conservation work and to figure out what the condition of the painting is and how the artist painted it. What's distinctive about Monet's painting here and what, you know, ties it with this sort of classic notion of impressionist painting is the fact of the artist working before the motif in, a, in an outdoor setting. We can really see the evidence of the thought process as uh, Monet prepared to go to Etretat and uh, execute a whole batch of these paintings in a, a really efficient way by looking at the materials. For this trip and for these works, he often chose to use a very fine canvas. Uh, this is a really similar grade of linen canvas to the, to the grade that Monet used there. And it's pretty densely woven, lightweight canvas. Really a practical choice for transporting and moving a group of paintings. And he would have bought this canvas stretched onto a wooden stretcher uh, and prepared already with this white ground. And we know from analysis that that ground is made of lead white in oil paint with a little bit of chalk mixed into it. It's a porous, thin layer which readily absorbs a little bit of the oil from the overlying paint to make it secure on the surface and anchor it. You know, his objective was to capture the effect of the light and the, the particularity of that moment before nature. And so when he started working, he actually worked this painting up in fairly broad fields with uh, an application of dashes of color across the sea, across the sky, and across the beach, which were sort of mid-tones of color. So they were these bright colors mixed with white, um, and they established that overall kind of key. Then it looks as though he went in and built up these structures and forms, like this capstan, which is a kind of winch to pull the boats up the beach. He's made them sing, in a way, with, with these vibrant dashes of color, tying everything together with, this, with these strokes of high key color on top of that underpainting. It allows him to paint quickly. A couple of industrial developments really contributed to the Impressionists working efficiently outdoors. One of them was the manufacture of flat ferrule brushes. So brushes like this, the painters really developed this distinctive visible brush stroke and allowed them to mix the colors wet into wet very effectively because you can load this. You can see a, a round profile brush is useful and it's useful for painting certain structures and these forms here. Another 19th century development that really facilitated uh, working outdoors was the collapsible metal tube. These were actually an American invention, but they became available in Europe in the 1840s. And by the time Monet is painting, the artists are using them. Uh, and before this use of this invention, artists would have to use, uh, they commonly used little pieces of pig's bladder that the paint was put into, and then they would pierce it and squirt the paint out onto their palette. But this is obviously much more practical. One thing that we know, however, is that he didn't paint it all at once. Uh, the, the impressionist practice that we think of is executing the painting uh, before the motif, in a single sitting, really quickly, but it's partly true. Because we know that Monet did go back in and make alterations to this painting. You can see some places where he just painted over shapes. And uh, in fact, you may be able to see here, because we've got a light coming from the side, that there are additional booms and masts that were painted out here and here. And I think he was tidying that or, or calming visual interference that all of these structures make going across that beach. Then there's a second campaign of changes which happen because we don't see them in the photograph from 1900 and that one of them is the signature 
The other major change that we can see in the photograph is that neither this painting nor a related work that is also appears in that photograph have the extensive yellow bows and other parts of these uh, boats, the rudder there as well. There are traces of those changes when you look closely at the painting. There's actually a slight difference in the way this area looks. This looks murkier somehow over here than... So, so there are slight variations within the application. And then the entire right side of the painting also has, perhaps has some signs of, of the artist reworking it. I think one of the hallmarks of Impressionist painting for modern audience is the way the artists incorporated such a bright and brilliant palette into their work. It's totally different to what we think of as sort of the academic palette. Late 18th and, and early 19th century saw new developments in the synthesis of compounds that could be used for pigments and their manufacture for industrial and then ultimately for artistic purposes. Well, one of the most well-known of these pigments is French ultramarine. There was a national competition in France to try and find a means to produce this pigment in an industrial way as a synthetic pigment that would allow much more efficient and much cheaper production because the mineral pigment actually had to be imported from Afghanistan and elsewhere and uh, produced in a laborious fashion. The chemists were able to devise a means uh, to produce what became known as French ultramarine in the 19th century. So that becomes, in a way, quite a sort of distinctive color for, for the Impressionists. Another color uh, in the blue palette, cobalt blue, which gives a sort of nice, solid, opaque, mid-tone blue with a little bit more of a greeny tinge than the ultramarine, uh, so useful for slightly different applications and we see that also extensively through the Impressionist palette. Some of the more traditional pigments that we know were used on, on this painting were lead white. In the 19th century, again because of a government project to encourage industrial development, France became one of the preeminent producers of lead white. It's the basic um, uh, white pigment that's used in this painting. One of the other traditional pigments that we have on this painting is vermilion. If you look closely at this painting, uh, there's another red which is, which is very distinctive and that is made with natural madder lake. A beautiful transparent pigment which we see throughout uh, all of these lines and details are painted with madder. And one of the other pigments that became very popular with artists and, and is very distinctive for this painting is Viridian. What's nice about the um, Viridian is, again, this transparency to give this either this intensity or this really beautiful darkness. One of the things that um, is often said about the Impressionist painters was that they rejected the use of black. We did not find black pigment anywhere on this painting. Monet did use black in some paintings, but one of the things that we found, which was quite common practice uh, for the Impressionists, was the way that some of these bright colors would be mixed together to effectively form a vibrant dark color by mixing a little bit of the Viridian with some matter, it's less matter, but we need more, and some of the French ultramarine, and when we mix the colors together, you see that they effectively cancel one another out, and you get a beautiful dark paint uh, this one has a little bit more of the viridian in it than the other colors, so it's kind of leaning on that green end, but you can see that you can effectively create a lovely saturated dark, which is what we see throughout all of these shapes. None of this is actually black. This is all uh, combinations of colors that produce the 
effect of darkness, but really en enriched darkness. One of the um, things that interests me about these Etretat paintings is the fact that, you know, fundamentally they're about beaches and rocks and all of these kind of geological subjects. Monet has narrowed down his palette to these pretty bright colors. But what you don't see here are pigments made basically from rocks, things like ochres and umbers. How he gets around that is by mixing a little bit of lead white on a little bit of the yellow. A bit of red, that will be very strong. And a bit of blue. All these colors are so intense that it requires quite a lot of working to get where we need to go. But what you can see is, I'll put a bit more white in there, you can basically emulate a kind of an ochre earth color by tweaking these constituent colors. But what's remarkable about this is just how opaque and what excellent covering it has and what vibrancy it has. And depending what colors you choose to put in there and how you do that, so when we look at the beach like this, it's got this amazing sort of palette of purples and violets and, and pinks. And that's all coming from different, slightly different combinations of this. Sometimes he'll probably mix in a little bit of the matter as well. One of the things that we also talk about in this exhibition is the process of painting wet into wet. So it's kind of a, a process of blending the color uh, on the painting really so you might have an area where you have a stroke of the white paint and then the artist might come in with viridian paint you get a kind of varied application and you get this kind of subtlety and uh, liveliness to it with the mixing of the colors right there sometimes he would just mix it on the brush itself and then come in with another color and you see how the combination and between the thinner parts of the brush stroke you get the earlier color coming through and then the crest of the brush stroke you can see here has the kind of untouched white on it and that sort of thing as you can imagine is uh, is really really effective for painting uh, the effects of water and the sea. It's got this two things that he's balancing this kind of immediate observation and the memory of the moment against uh, working things up later.